for the Lord as Pastor Jonathan comes up. You need a Vanna White. You have many things you're carrying here. See, look, the he looks handsome, right? Okay. Stop it. No gracias. <laughs> Are you guys feeling this morning? Let us turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 16 is where we'll spend the majority of our... May, maybe we won't be in Luke. We'll see. Just turn to the New Testament. Just turn to the New Testament. And... Um, uh, I just got a text message this morning as I was pulling into um, uh, the parking lot here from my good friend, Pastor Mark Rodriguez in uh, Florida. Some of y'all may remember him. He's preached here several times. Um, uh, I was with his family this week as um, we celebrated the life of his sister who passed away from COVID uh, two Sundays ago. And just a few minutes ago, his other sister, who was also in a ventilator, just coded. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I told him that the church would pray. And so, if we can just take a moment right now and just pray and ask God to um, uh, be with their family. And I'm a little bit too emotional to deal with it. So, Pastor RJ, if you can come up and, 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 and lead us in a prayer at this time. Maybe you too, Pastor Kevin Williams, sir. You too. Come on. This is, this is, we've got to really, really intercede on their behalf. Um, I cannot imagine what it would look like for two sisters to go away. So. We're here. Yeah. All right. I'll open you close. If you could just stretch your hands. Can we lay hands on you? I know. You're a part of this as well. This is a part of our church. The church is a people, not a building. And so we mourn with those who mourn as well. So if we could just do that and receive for this family. I'll open. You can close, Pastor Kevin. Father, we just, Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the relationships that have been given to Pastor Jonathan through this family. And if they are his family, they are our family, Lord God. So our hearts break along with them. Father, we thank you that you say that you are close to the brokenhearted and you save those who are crushed in spirit. So, Father, would you be with our family right now who are crushed, Lord? Father, would you be their strength, Lord God? Um, hmm. Hmm. Lord, be their strength. Father, where they do not have the words, we pray for them right now. We intercede. We take up our post right now to intercede. Would you be their strength? Would they, be, would they feel free to cry before you this morning, Lord God? May they be free to, uh, to just be before your throne this morning, Lord God. And Father, we... We pray that as, as they do cry, Lord, that your arms would just be wrapped around them, that angels would be around their room, oh Lord. Father, that you would just protect their peace in this time as they are before you. We pray that your spirit would continually be with them and upon them, Lord God. Would it rest on their hearts, Lord Jesus. May they feel free before you to feel anything that they feel as we have all been there before, for we know that you give strength in these times, that there will be but God moments, but you are with them, no matter what is on their hearts right now. Would you put safe people around them, Lord God, to also intercede and to pray and to lay hands as you're praying on their behalf as we are doing now. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're magnificent and that you're mighty in all that you do. Father, we pray that um, our prayers uh, join the prayers of those uh, around the, all of your churches for this family. 
uh, for the Rodriguez's. Father, we thank you that you are a healer and that you are the author and the finisher of all of our faiths. You are the one who pins our stories. Father, we thank you that as you pin this story, that your will be done and that they feel the peace that surpasses all understanding. Uh, in this situation, Father, we corporately come together and pray for the wisdom and the knowledge and the peace that you bring, not that it's of our, of our own. Father, we thank you that your strength will lift that family up and that whatever the outcome is, Father, that you are still God, that you are in full control and that your book is still being written. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We're certain that you feel and hear their prayers. And Father, we ask that you bring healing if that's your cause. And Father, we ask that you bring peace if that's your cause. And Father, we ask for all of these things in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And all who can agree with that prayer, we say amen. amen. If you don't mind, would you just pray real quick for you, Pastor Jonathan. Lord, just as he preaches, as, his, um, as you have called him to give a word today, Father, would you just, Holy Spirit, give him the words, let him rest in them. May he find his strength in you this morning as he ministers. And we know that you have something good for us. And may he just have the confidence that whatever God, whatever you have to give, that it is good and it's what's necessary for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. All right. Let us get in the word, amen? Amen. My, 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 my God is good. My God is good. My God is, is bigger than COVID. He's bigger than cancer. He's bigger than than anything that brings fear and, and, and destruction and pain on this planet. He's just, he's just that good. Amen? The Africans have a song. The Africans. <laughs> they have a song. It goes like this. My God is good. My God is good. Some of y'all know it. And that's just, those are the words. My God is good. That's when it's so good, you have to add an O, an extra vowel on the, on the end of it. He's good, oh. <laughs> Amen. He's good. He's good. I'm having all kinds of technical issues this morning. My printer wouldn't work. Nothing was working. So we're going to do this this way. Is that all right with y'all? Um, I am not on Facebook. But just in case, I might check. <laughs> just in case. All right. Um, I'm going to pray again so we can jump in. Is that all right with y'all? <sighs> Let's do this. Let's all stand up this time. Let's stand up. I'm going to change the energy a little bit. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, lift up your hands to heavens and say, God, I receive everything you have for me today. I receive your word. I believe it is transformative that my life can be changed today. My perspective can shift. That I can put down the idols that I've worshipped in exchange to worship you. The true and living God. Breathe your spirit on me today. May I receive everything that is from your heart to give life to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, clap it up. You may be seated. You may be seated. So, um, a few years ago, I was going to bring this to you all, but I, I, I forgot. I, I um, was in downtown L.A. Pauline and I were just... Um, uh, uh, getting ready to get married. We were planning to get married. I went down to L.A. to go and find myself a, a suit. Um, and I also wanted to have all my groomsmen to wear suits that they would not have to rent because to me, I did not under, it never made sense to me after being a, a, a groomsman for many, many years that, that every time I have to rent something for $170 and then I have to give it back. So I was like, I'm not going to do this to my friends. If they're going to pay $170, they're going to take that suit home. 
Until this day, I'm glad to report to you that after 12 years, some of those gentlemen still wear that suit. They still do. You, 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 you see them in formal events, and there they are, rocking, the, rocking my wedding suit. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like that suit's going to last the length of our marriage. I don't know if that's, okay, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we can go there. I don't know if we can go there. But while I was there, while I was in downtown L.A., I saw something that I've never seen before. As an African man, I've never seen this before. I saw an African panhandler. Like, like you all, you know you've never met an African asking you for money on the street. Excuse me, brother, do you have a dollar? It doesn't happen. They're usually trying to sell you something. So, so I, I, this, this African guy approaches me and asks me for money, and I'm like, eh, eh, where are you from? <laughs> you must not be from Africa. Africans do not come here to beg people for money. They come here to go to school so they can go back to their village and build a hospital. So he looked at me and says, you're correct, but I can sell you something. I'm like, yes, my people. He pulled out these, these coins. He says, I'll sell you these precious coins, these vintage coins, for $16. I was like, deal. Because if they're at least worth something, maybe, you know, maybe the silver content in them can be worth something. So I, I bought the coins, about eight of them. And I went to Barnes & Noble immediately to find a coin book. Because I became a coin collector on that day. And let me tell you what happened. I go to Barnes & Noble, and I opened up the, the, the book on coins and everything, and the first coin that I saw was a coin that I had in my new collection. And it was worth $247,000 because it had been in circulation, and it was rare. It was a 1776 silver dollar. I was like, holy smoke, we are rich. I was like, this woman who's about to marry me better sign a prenup. <laughs> I could not sleep that entire weekend. I went to every Barnes & Noble between L.A. and Redlands in order to see if they had a different coin book because I was now a coin collector certified. On Monday morning, the first thing I did was go to a coin shop. And as I walked in, I started to pull out my coins, and the owner of the coin shop said, those are fake. Get them out of my store. I'm like, Negro. You don't know what I have, my brother. How can you judge the content of my coin collection without even in investigating and seeing what it is that I have? So he says, wait right here. Goes to the back, comes back with a box, and he says, you see these coins that I have right here? These are real. You see those ones that you have over there? They don't look like the real thing. Get them out of my store. And there was my rags to riches, back to rags story. I bring that up to say that it's interesting how, how money changes your mood sometimes. Like, 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 like when, you're, when you know that you're about to get the bag and you have it in your hand, you're like, holy smoke, I, I, I got this. Life is about to change. Hello, somebody. My life is about, that wedding is about to be paid off. We're buying a house on Tuesday. This woman is going to, I was in a whole different state because I thought I had something. Now, what I want to share with you this morning is, uh, yes, you came on the right day. We're talking about money again. If you show up next week, guess what we'll be talking about? And guess, if you show up a year from now, guess what we'll be talking about? Money. Because of things, here's what I've discovered most people, all they think about, really, all their decisions are based around, guess what? Money. Can you serve next week? I don't know. I work. Why? Money. Everything goes back to, everyone say money. I say, I need money. Anybody need money? So, I'd like to offer you probably what I'd say the, for me, in my life, a teaching that I, for one, have never experienced in church. 
which is probably what we've been dealing with the last couple of weeks. Anybody can attest to that? Okay. But today I'd like to offer something to you that is, that is completely busting me up as well. And I hope it busts your head open as well. And you will have a decision to make when you leave this place. Whether or not you're going to go back to the same mamby-pamby life that you've lived. Why are you calling my life mamby-pamby? Because it is. <laughs> if it's not in the kingdom, if it is not driven by kingdom principles, if it is driven by anything else, it is not even a life. The principal problem, the principal problem that we are facing in our world right now is failed governments. Failed what? Governments. We are in the middle of a recall in our state because of a what? Failed governments. Every election, it's an argument over the failed administration of whoever was in charge before. Failed government. And God's solution to this world's problem is what? Hello, somebody. Is another government. God's solution is not democracy. God's solution is not socialism. God's solution is not communism. God's solution is not the Republican Party. God's solution is not Larry Elder. God's solution is not Donald Trump. God's solution is not any system or leader of a system that you have known to follow, enjoy, and like. And here's the thing about it, y'all Christians. Let me talk about y'all Christians, y'all, 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 y'all Christians who, who like to say, well, this is a Christian party. Screw your thinking in the name of Jesus. That's not God's solution. God's solution is not a political party or political system. It is another government. It is another what? Government. Every system has been tried. Every system known to mankind, whether it was a, a, a theocracy, a democracy, a, a ca socialism, capitalism, communism, um, uh, whateverism that has ever been known to mankind has been tried. The only government that has not been tried by the United Nations is a government called the kingdom of God. It has not been tried yet. They have not accepted it as a viable kingdom. And the thing about it is this, is that uh, Albert Einstein said these words. He said, you can't solve a problem at the same level it was created. To solve it, you must ascend and get a solution that is from a higher dimension or a higher level. Every problem on earth was created by us. And guess what we do to fix it? We elect us. But the problem is us. So we need something that is outer world to enter us, to enter into the system in order to shape, shift, and change some things around us. Amen? Are we together? We demand from the politicians what we ourselves don't have. That's why man always fails you. We demand from people what we already are dealing with ourselves. Are we together? Everything on TV right now, during an election, recall Newsom, all these things, it's all based, you know, it's all based on one thing, an economic issue. It's all based on what? An economic issue. Everything that you see, that you experience in life, everything that they argue about on MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, everything that they're discussing is an economic issue. You want to know why we went to Afghanistan? It was an economic issue. You want to know why we went to Iraq? It was an economic issue. You want to know why we don't go to Nigeria? It's in everything that, 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 that they argue about, that they're jostling and, and, and fighting over, is an economic issue. Consider this. Consider this. Go to Matthew chapter 24, verse, verse 14. I want, I want you to see this real quick. If you can throw it up on the, on the overhead real, real quick. It says this. And this gospel, everyone say this gospel. 
of the kingdom. Of what? The kingdom, which is something that 99.8% of the churches don't ever really get into. Everyone here has heard, seek ye first the kingdom of God, but y'all don't even know what it is. I might take a year just to deal with it. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a what? Testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. When will the end come? After the testimony of the kingdom. Now, the thing about a testimony is that a testimony can only occur after something has been tested. Are we together? So, so what I'd like to offer you as something to consider is that this kingdom of God is going to be tested at some point. And then the end will come. Are we together? It will be tested. People will see it. And it will give testimony. And then the end will come. The kingdom will be tested after they, and then after that, the end will come. We'll, we'll, we'll get to taste his kingdom. So, the kingdom of God, in simple terms, is a nation. Are we together? It's, it, it's a nation. It, it, is a, uh, it has its economy. It has its commonwealth. Uh, Jesus came to bring this kingdom. That was his purpose, was to bring the kingdom. Uh, uh, his ideas about how things should run revolved around him restoring to mankind that which was lost. You see, what happens in the Garden of Eden, if I can, if I can teach you for a second, is this is that God creates mankind on earth, places him in a garden. Why does he place him in a garden? God is a king, and he builds a colony. And he puts his kids on that colony. Why would he do that? Because he is expanding his kingdom. Now, in the retelling of the Tower of Babel, um, uh, which is, you, you go back, Genesis, Deuteronomy, you can go back and, and, and read on this. Just, just Google it, okay? In the retelling of the Tower of Babel, what happens is this, is that it says, and, and God separated the nations according to the number of the sons of God. Whole nother conversation. Buy me a drink and we can have three hours on that. Because that right there will completely discombobulate your entire concept of what, what's really going on. He separates them and then he says, Israel will be my inheritance. And so the rest of the world is controlled by other principalities. Rulers. I'll leave it at that. But Israel is his. When Jesus comes, what he does is this. He says, God's saying, I know for a period of time it was only Israel that was my people and that was my colony and my, 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 my child, my children were Israel. But now that I've sent Jesus, Jesus shows up and he says, God wants it all, all the earth. Are you with me? All the nations are now going to be reclaimed and brought back to God. Are we together? The moment that he exposes himself and Jesus is transfigured, that's when all hell breaks loose. Because the war that you don't see, that we don't see on a day-to-day -day basis, spiritually was enacted. And now the rulers and the principalities of this world were on attack mode. We must get rid of him or else we're going to lose our stuff. Are we together? Have I lost anybody? All right, cool. Jesus' ideas is to restore that which was lost, to give us a kingdom. He came to give us a kingdom and not a religion. Are we together? The greatest opposition that he had were religious leaders because they were interested in more religion, and what he was interested in was a kingdom. He didn't bring a religion. He brought a kingdom, not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. It is a, say it proudly, it is a kingdom. 
You are a kingdom of priests. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus, every king before he comes, he's announced by a herald. Not herald, but a herald. <laughs> he's announced by, by someone who comes and announces him. And so what did John the Baptist say? John the Baptist came preaching about the kingdom of God. And he was saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Speaking about Jesus, announcing Jesus, his cousin. Jesus shows up, and the very first sermon, go to Mark chapter 1, verse 14. The very first sermon that Jesus preaches is, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's saying, the kingdom of God is here. It has arrived. That The time has been fulfilled. The kairos has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here at hand. It's here. It's here. It's, it's now. It's not future. It's not, it's not something that's going to come at a later date, but rather I have, I, it's been announced that I was coming, and now I have arrived. Here I am, and I've brought the kingdom with me. And from there on, he, he keeps on saying, and it says that, and Jesus started preaching about the what? The kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the what? The kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom. Over and over in all the Gospels, what you'll discover is that the only thing that Jesus preached was the kingdom. The only thing that he announced was the kingdom. Every parable that he told was about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is this. The kingdom of God is like this. And every parable, for the most part, is a parable that deals with assets. The kingdom of God is an issue of how one manages assets, land, money. Everyone say money. With my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, as it is on earth, as it is in, it's, it's here. The kingdom is here. That's what he preached about. He preached about the gospel of the kingdom. Now, what is a kingdom? Uh, a kingdom is a governing authority by influence of a king over a territory, impacting it with his will, purposes, and intent, values, morals, lifestyles, producing a people who will reflect the king's culture and will his will and his nature. That is a kingdom. Are we, are, we, are we clear? A kingdom is a governing authority by influence of a king over a territory. A nation is governed by a king. Are we together? Not a religion. So in Jesus' kingdom, we have a king. There's about 12 different things that a kingdom has. We have a king. We have a lord. We have a language, we have land, we have a body of laws, we have a constitution, are we together? We have an army, we have moral codes, we have shared values, we have culture, we have customs, and guess what else we have? Economy. We have an economy. And every kingdom is different based on the king. Are we solid? Every kingdom is different based on the king. So Jesus came to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth, to bring the commonwealth of heaven here on earth. And, and, and the thing about it, here's the biggest lie. The biggest lie that you're told in the Baptist church, in the Pentecostal church, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, in the whatever bedside Baptist, Coastal, Church of God of Prophecy, Holy Spirit, Sanctuary, Tabernacle church. I'm an equal opportunity offender this morning. The, 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 the biggest lie that you're taught somehow is that God wants you to have a good life after you die and go to heaven. He wants you to experience the goodness of who he is when you die and go to heaven. And here's the thing about it. Jesus never once taught that. What he taught was, you can have the kingdom now. 
It is in you. It is within you. It is among you. It is you. He says that. He says, blessed are those who have left father, house, mother, sister, brothers, lands, resources. Because in this, someone say this lifetime. In this lifetime, you will gain a hundredfold. My, my Calvary Chapel people are like, oh, well, let's really look at what that hundredfold really stands for. Shut up. <laughs> Just look at the text. A hundredfold with persecutions because you're still in this earth system. And the age to come, eternal life. But the blessing of the kingdom is something that is tangible and accessible to you when? Now. now. It is now. Christ didn't teach that you have to wait till you go to heaven to, 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 to get all the good stuff, to enjoy the blessed life. The kingdom of God can be established on earth by you, and you don't have to wait until heaven. But the thing is, is that most of us are driven by the kingdom of this world. And that's why we never really access the kingdom of heaven. We, 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 we are driven by the things of this earth. The kingdom of this earth is regulated by money, greed, and using people to get money. It, it, it's very simple. If you want to know if someone is kingdom of God or something is kingdom of, of, of darkness, it's simple. Does it use people to get stuff or does it use stuff to get people that's the only that's the differentiating line right there is it me manipulating and and and, and using people in order to enrich myself or is it me taking assets laptops phones money cash cars whatever it is in order to win people to this kingdom And people like to debate about capitalism. I'll tell you right now, I'm a capitalist. <laughs> but my capitalism has to surrender to the kingdom values. I'll operate in the economy in order to use unrighteous wealth for when it fails, they, remember that, right, will welcome you into eternal dwellings. So people like to debate, oh, does capitalism really work? Oh, capitalism, this. But it's usually like, you know, a lot of white guilt people who like to fight over that stuff. <laughs> um, I like to argue over capitalism. Does it work? Does it, and you know, like there, there are other systems. There are others. I, I, let me tell you something. I'm, this is not in my notes. This is not even anointed right now. It's just Jonathan Lima speaking. I have never seen people, a group of people, trying to sneak into Cambodia. <laughs> like if we can just get into Cambodia. Let's go to Venezuela. They've got a system of government that just works. It's just, you've never seen it. You've never seen people hanging off of a Delta airplane saying, this plane is leaving America. It doesn't happen. So as flawed as the system is, let's go ahead and get into capitalism. Capitalism is flawed because it produces poverty. We can debate that. But in, capital, in a capitalistic system, 97% of the people are consumers and 3% are the producers. The only thing is that you can get it. You, you have a choice whether or not you want to be a consumer all your life or a producer. You get a choice to either watch Netflix and consume, have, have the subscription and Hulu and all the other cable channels that you have, or you have the choice to go start your own network. I love this country. <laughs> but sometimes in a capitalistic system, what happens is that people will capitalize on the weak to make themselves stronger. It happens all the time. And so Jesus, what Jesus does is that he studies the earth and all the systems that have been known to the earth. 
that has been tried on the earth. And he breaks it down and reduces it into two categories. Two categories. Which brings us to our text this morning. Luke 16, verse 1. For those of you who have not been with us, I'll catch you up. He said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought up to, to the manager. And the rich man said to the manager, what is this that I've heard about you? Give an accounting of, 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 of your management, for you can no longer be my manager. So what's happening is that you are going to be fired. You're fired. As a matter of fact, I'm giving you a notice that you have X amount of days to train your replacement. You can no longer be my manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I'm too ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I'm removed from management, people will receive me into their houses. So he went to the creditor. Summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe your master? He says, I owe 100 measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and quickly write 50. He said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, I owe 100 measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in the dealings with their own generation than the sons of light. He's saying, y'all Christians are dumb. The people who don't even know me, who are not part of my kingdom, understand the economies of what it takes to be taken care of in the future. They will use assets to build relationships, but you will just sit on your assets. He goes on. And I tell you, this is Jesus speaking to you all. Turn, turn to your neighbor and say, he's speaking to me. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, not if it fails, not if you store up enough, but when it fails, because it's inevitable for it to do what? Fail. It's going to fail. Look at, pull out your wallet real quick. Just pull out your wallet. Pull out some debit cards. Pull out something. Let me just wave it in your hair. Just, 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 just wave it. Just, just, I just want to see every, if you got $5. Right? Yeah, just, just hold it. I, I want you to look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Put it in front of your, your face, in front of your nose right now. And just look at it and say, you are going to fail me. It's inevitable for you to fail me. I can make as much of you as I want, but you will fail me. When it fails, you, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Next verse. One who's faithful in very little is also faithful in much. One who's dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will trust you? With true riches. He goes on. If you have not been faithful with that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant, everyone say no servant, can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot do what? And I know that there's some of y'all in the audience right now that are thinking, well, it's a balance. <laughs> it's a balance. It's a, it's a, it's a balance. Uh, Pastor Belima, it is a balance. You have to, I need, to, I need money to eat, so I, I serve money a little bit, and then I give what God belongs to God is God, 10%. I grew up in the church. I know how it works. 90% is mine. 10% belongs to the Lord. It's called a tithe. A master means something that controls you. Something that rules you. What Jesus is saying is that there's only two masters. There's only two governing entities on this planet, God and money. Only two. 
There's only two masters on this planet, God and money. Write that down, please. There's only two masters on this planet. What are they? God and money. No matter the politics, no matter the ideology, no matter the philosophy, Republican or Democrat, there are only two things that drive people, God or money. When you evaluate your life, only ask one question. Is this God or is it money that is driving me? Is it God or is it money that drives me? I'm, I brought my own amen today. I don't, I don't need y'all's. <laughs> so feel free to just be silent and just take the, take the medicine. Republican or Democrat, socialist, capitalist, democratic socialist, neo-capitalist, green capitalist. There's only one, two things that drive you, God or money. Don't let anybody's ideology or, or philosophy fool you. Here's the thing about it. We've been taught, you've been taught, I've been taught. That the number one enemy to God on this planet is the devil. But Jesus never said anything about the devil. He says there's only two things that people serve. God and money. Money is way more powerful than the devil, according to Jesus. He said, you can only serve two masters. Either you're going to serve God or you're going to serve the devil. Who are you serving? He doesn't say that. He says you're going to serve two people, two entities, God and or money, God or mammon, in some translations. Jesus disagrees with your theology. He's not concerned about the devil. As a matter of fact, I would, I would, I would, I would challenge you to find a stronger warning against the devil in the New Testament from Jesus. There is none. This is not the first time that he's talked about God and money. In Matthew, he talks about the same thing. You can only serve two masters. There's only two masters. There's only two masters. On this planet, there are only two, what? Masters. It's either God or money. It's either you wake up and do things because of God or money. It's, you're motivated only by two things, God or money. You make decisions as to who will be your friend because of God or money. Are you with me? Because if you hang out with five broke friends, you're about to be the sixth one, so you might as well change your friends. <laughs> Even that's regulated by money. Only two things, God or money. Only thing more dangerous than the devil is what? Money. Money, 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 money. Thank you. The thing is that in the, in, the management, in the management of our master's assets, 100% of us at one point in our life get confused and start serving the assets and not the master. That was the problem with the dishonest manager. He stopped serving the master and started serving the money. Are you with me? Stop serving the master and start serving the money. Uh, see, the thing is this, that you're called to serve God and make the money serve you and the master. What are you called to do? Serve God and make money serve your God as well. Are, are, are we together? As, as some of us try, try, to, try to do both things, like I, I'm going to balance this. You know, Christ is not really giving a balanced view here. You know, there's, there's some nuance to what he's saying. Money's important. Amen. But here's the thing about it. He doesn't give you a, a neutral zone. He says it's either or. It's either money or it's God. It's either money or it's God. You either hate one or you love the other. It's extreme. It's, it's, it's completely bat crazy extreme here. So there are four things. I want you to catch these four things that Jesus is saying. If you really love God, you will hate money. 
Am I making this up? Now, nobody wants to answer that question. If you really love God, you will hate money. Second thing he's saying is that if you really are holding on to God, you will despise money. Third thing, if you love money, it proves that you hate God. Fourth thing, if you hold on to money, it proves that you despise God. And so most Christians, I put it in bold in my notes, most so-called Christians actually hate God. Because they love money more than they love God. How do I know? Say, Pastor, how do you know? I know because most Christians do not give a damn about God's work. They care more about Starbucks. If most of you would just replace your Starbucks budget and give, you'd change everything. But we're more committed. To the goddess. There she is. <laughs> I'd like to submit to you um, uh, that the reason why most people can't stand going to the church to hear about money is because it, it's, it's, it's rearranging the furniture in their life. It's exposing what they truly care about. It's, it's don't talk about money. <laughs> Do you know who was getting upset about Jesus talking all this money stuff? His, op his opponents, the Pharisees. It says it right there in the verse. In the next verse, verse 14. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. <sighs> He's talking about money again. Oh, my God. When's this going to be over? Like, sheesh. And they said to him, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, and God knows your hearts. For what is exalted amongst men is an abomination in the sight of God. You can't be neutral. You can't be neutral towards money. It is that important. You can't be neutral. And my question to you is have you come to a point of decision in your life on where money stands and where God stands in your life? No, 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 don't give me a theoretical, yeah, 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 no, no, no. Did you ever have a conscious decision where you sat down and you opened up your Chase account, your Bank America account, your, your BBVA or whatever it is that you have, your Cash App, your Venmo, your Zelle, whatever it is that you use, your, your EBT. Is that what it's called? And literally looked at it and said, I am making a conscious decision today. You will no longer control me. You will not wake me up in the morning. You will not drive my decisions. You will not drive my passion for God. You will not drive whether or not I live and serve and, and, and experience uh, and, and share my faith with other people. Because here's the thing about it. So, I, I hear it all the time. And, 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 and like I told you, I, I've, like, you know, I've lost all interest in, in, in people being interested in me. So I'm just kind of like you know, telling it it is. Uh, Pastor Jonathan 2.0, here it is. Um, I hear it all the time. Uh, I don't know if we can serve that day because, you know, I work. I work all week. I work. I, I have to work. You should understand. Money's important. Yeah, I, I get it. You can only serve two masters. Oh, you know, it's just, it's just, I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love to uh, support this, but, you know, we're planning a vacation. You got to save up, God or money. Have you come to a point where you've made a conscious decision? Or are you drifting in neutral around this issue? question becomes, well, how are you supposed to hate money, Pastor Jonathan? You want me to live in a monastery, take a vow of poverty, move to a faith home? And that's the extreme of it. 
Because Jesus did not come to make you live like a hermit. Are you with me? Man, that's, my God is good, oh. My God is good, oh. He's just, he, I love it. I love it because, he, because the thing about it is like, yo, if you just seek my kingdom, guess what? All that other stuff is added to you anyways. But, but if, you chase, if you chase the stuff, guess what? That's what you worship. It's going to fail. If, if you just enter and say that, you know what? I am part of God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, I can say this with 100% certainty. There is no poverty in God's kingdom. There is no lack in God's kingdom. There is no disease in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, everything is yes and amen. And he promises me some good stuff. He promises me some good steak and, and, and all the sides and all. See, the thing about it is this, is, is this. Let me give you a story. Let me give you a story about, about God and money and, and, and serving God and money. Have you ever been in a situation where you go to restaurants and you choose what you're going to eat by the right-hand side of the menu? I'm just talking about myself. I go to a restaurant I'm like, okay, what are all my friends are like, oh, we're going to. True story. This happened to me before. Told, I'm sure I've shared the story before. I get invited to a, to a dinner, and, and, and um, uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to come to this. But I only had like $13.48 in my bank account at the time. You know, some of y'all have never been there before, but that's pain. When you've you got it two weeks before you can get more money, you'll make some rash decisions. You'll go and donate plasma. <laughs> you will sign up for an experiential lab. I tell the truth. I speak no lies right now. I have a scar on my arm from going to donate my body to be tested of all kinds of drugs that there are not on the market yet. It's called Harris Labs, MDS Harris, Lincoln, Nebraska. Pauline's laughing because she knows. <laughs> Where, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, we can't hang out. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going on a retreat. If I come back a little woozy and with a third eye, I just. <laughs> we were doing ayahuasca. I don't know. <laughs> just, just kidding. But I remember like being in a situation where like I, I was looking on the right hand side of the menu. I'm like, oh, twelve dollars and fifty cents. I'll be having Caesar salad. Decisions made because of money. Let's wrap this thing up. I have a long way to go. It's all good. J Jesus lived a normal life. Okay? He, he, he had a carpentry business. So he worked with his stepdad, Joseph. They sold goods in order to bring in money to put food on the table and to take care of his mom, Mary, and his, and his brothers, James and, and Raul. <laughs> Hi, man, Raul. He spent money. He made money. He also had tax problems. It's in the Bible. There was one situation where they're like, yo, we, we need to pay our taxes for you. You only pay your taxes if you've been making money. Amen, somebody. He tells Peter, go, go fish. There's a, there's, a, there's a coin somewhere in, in, in a fish. It's a whole other miracle. It's a whole other teaching on money, too. And I'd like to submit this to you. There's all kinds of books that are written about love languages. Do you want to know what God's love language is? I used to say Giving. But I stopped as of this morning. God's love language is money. What are you doing with your money? Exposes how devoted you are to him. What are you chasing in your money goals? Exposes your devotion towards him. Money is his method of reward. It is how you manage it that his assets that speaks to his heart. You get God's attention based on how you handle 
the assets that he places in your hands. The blessing that he wants to unlock and unleash in your life is directly related to how you handle what he places in your hands. Am I helping anybody? What drives a beautiful woman from a good home to dress up, put on her lipstick, makeup, and go to a situation where she sells her body? You want to say the devil? I'll say no, it's money. What, what, what drives a, a man to wake up at 5 in the morning, go to work, work 8 hours, get off at 3 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, go to another job, and work till 2 in the morning at the other job, and never see his wife and kids, and never be there for anybody, and see his marriage destroyed within a four-year period of that type of cycle? Nothing but money-driven. What drives an individual who has a wonderful, promising career? To trade his hard-earned integrity to take on a bribe. Money. What makes a politician go into office broke and come out a bazillionaire? Well, yeah. Equal opportunity offense today. What drives Fauci? What drives Biden? What drives Trump? What drives Cuomo? What drives Don Lemon? What drives anything? That's why we can't trust anything in the world system because it is, money is the root of all evil. Are you with me? Is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that money is the fruit of all evil. It says money is the root of all evil. We never see the root of something, but the root is the bottom line. The love of money. So basically Jesus is saying, listen, money is more powerful than the devil, and the economy that, of this world runs on either money or God. What wakes you up in the morning? Is it God or is it money? If you get up in the morning rushing, oh, I got to get to work. Oh, my God. <laughs> putting lipstick on in the car. I see it all the time. Like, you know, we can see you putting on your makeup. And we see you picking your nose. You were fine until that happened. <laughs> Moving right along. If you never take a moment to say, I am going to spend time with God to direct my day and your day looks more like the other, I want to let you know, ding, 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 you're driven by money. You're not driven by God. Money is the bottom line. It is a driver. I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody came to me and said, Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan, I have a great idea. This idea is it's just going it's, it's to it's help so many people. My question is usually, so how does the money move? It's what drives and motivates most situations. Are we together? I'm almost done, I promise. Almost done. I'm, wrap, I'm wrapping it up. I've had this happen. Pastor, sign me up for this. If we just sign up for this program, we're going to give 10% to the church. It's going to make a lot of money. I want to let you know something. I will never sell your list in order to gain money. Are you with me? At least every six months, something like that happens. Oh, we have got, I've got this great idea, and it's gonna, you guys can build a building if we just sign up at least 50% of your members to this phone service. I'm like, I know some preachers who are in jail over that crap. <laughs> Not me. Now, if you could sign it up under my wife and then somehow do a proxy around. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually their idea. <laughs> the 
thing is this, that you're either using leverage or you're the leverage. And that's what, that's what the text is really saying. It's either you're going to be the leverage or you are the leverage. Or you're going to leverage your resources for something greater and something bigger. Are we together? Are we going to have a currency exchange where you take the things that you manage and exchange them for people because it is the people that actually enter into that new economy of the kingdom with you? Are we together? Hold on a second, Matt. I need like seven more minutes. <laughs> I just, I just, sorry, I just realized I, I don't want to miss this point. It's very, very important for you get, to get this. It's, it's God or money, and you can't have both. And Jesus is saying mankind is either going to be motivated by either the pursuit of money or the pursuit of God. And the thing about it is this, that if you will stop chasing money, money will start chasing you. If you stop chasing money, money will start chasing you. It will chase you. If you chase money, money will always outrun you. Do you remember when we were giving God pr the praise because you got, a, you got a promotion and a raise? Remember that? How come we can't praise anymore? Because you got the promotion and you got the raise, but you're still in the same financial situation. Why? Because if your pursuit is money, money will always outrun you. More money, more problems, said the great prophet P. Diddy. So I want, to, I want to show you this verse in Ecclesiastes because it's, it's, it's hyper important. It says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. Can you throw it up there real quick? We'll start at verse 8. It says, he who loves money will not be satisfied. Go back, go back. He who loves money will, will not be satisfied with money, nor who loves wealth with his income. This is also a vanity. Keep going. Let's, let's read the rest. When goods increase, they will increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them his eyes? Next verse, sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Go back and meditate on these, please. Go, go on, let's go to verse 14 real quick. And those rich, 13, there's a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. To whose hurt? His hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. Keep going. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came, and he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. I, I want you to see the balance here. This is also a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who has toils for the wind? This is people who are driven by money. Next verse. Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation, and in sickness and in anger. Next verse. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and to drink and to find enjoyment in all the toil which one toils under the sun for the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Watch this. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. Do, do, is that almost like a contradiction? What I'd like to submit to you is that it is one person who is chasing money and another person who's pursuing the kingdom. One enjoys what God gives. Because when it wasn't about you, you can actually have a praise. But when it's all dependent on you chasing it and you making it, you'll vex. You'll trip. More money, more problems. So he's saying, seek something that isn't motivated by money. In a democracy, people make ch rules. People make, change the rules. In a kingdom, the king makes the rules, and the king is lord over all the rules. In a democracy, there's private ownership. In a kingdom, the king owns everything. Are we together? In a democracy, people compete for resources. In the kingdom, you prefer one another. In a kingdom, you prefer one another. 
There's a verse that I can't stand. I hate this verse. I like to rip it out of the Bible sometimes. In Matthew 5, 42, Jesus said, give to who asks of you. He says, give to who asks of you. You know what that means? If somebody asks of you, you give it. You give it. Amen? And, and, and so, so here's the thing. Here's, you want to know the reason why there's poverty? There's poverty because someone's keeping what they should have given. Someone is keeping that which you did not rec- you, you couldn't receive. Poverty is impossible in the kingdom of God when there's currency that is flowing amongst kingdom people. So I need like five people, five people, real quick. Five people. P- five people who need money. All right, so, so, so here's what we're going to do, right? Um, I'm just going to give you all money. Just stand in line right there. Actually, let's get kind of in a little bit of a, same, a circle so that you, we, we connect. Let me do that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe like that. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So, so here, here's, here's how currency works. Um, and you can keep however much you want to keep. Oh, so I can pass it? You, if, you, if you don't want it, you can pass it, but you can keep it, too, if you need it. What if I don't need it? Well, you can, then you can keep on passing it. <laughs> if you want it. I'm not in the game. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> keep it going. At one point, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop in a second here. I'm going to tell you all to stop in a second. Okay? So I won't look. I won't look. (laughs) Stop. Okay. How come you don't have any money? I gave it away. (laughs) You You gave it away? Okay. This is why there's poverty in the kingdom of God. Someone was supposed to keep the flow going. Ooh. Wow. He said stop. I'm like, okay. Wow. Okay. This is this is exactly what happens. You get resources, and somewhere along the way, you start thinking, oh, you don't even know where the money comes from. The resources are are handed to you, keep passing it, are handed to you by God. Another entity who governs, who gives seed to his servants. That's how God works. You think it was your job, it was God providing the resource, adding it in there. But the moment you block the blessing because you got selfish. Someone goes without. Thank you very much, y'all. Take your money and go. I'd go deeper with that to show you who has what. Because even that was probably motivated. They had ones that had fives, and I'm pretty sure some of y'all were passing according to what was the denomination. <laughs> The exercise does not lie. I've seen it over and over again. Folks will say, oh, that's a five. I'm keeping this over here. I'm just going to pass the ones now. (laughs) And exposes your relationship to money. Some people will get it and immediately just get rid of it because they feel unworthy of it. It's because their inner spirit has not finally gotten to a place of saying, God wants to actually bless me. 
be very afraid of an unsaved person who you owe $50 to. I have heard that they kill people for that in some neighborhoods. Why? Because they're driven by money. I can tell you about many mob stories I've watched just because they say, I killed him on principle. He was short $50. It just exposes, I worship money. Money is my life. And that's why that made sense that I should take someone's life for taking my $50. Are you with me? Last week, uh, Patrick uh, handed me a $50 after service. Because here's the thing about it. Here's how money works. You going to know how money works? Money goes into your hand. Hands me 50 bucks. When you get the money in your hand, when God places money in your hands, sometimes you have no idea what the purpose was that he put it in your hands for. Patrick gave, gave me 50 bucks after service. And I looked at him kind of awkwardly like, why? I, I just got done preaching about money. I wasn't saying give it to me. It's kind of weird. But I was like, let me not take away his blessing. I'll just take it and, and I'll see what happens. Five minutes later, my kids and their friends and their cousins, Eli and all of them, show up saying, we want popcorn. We want popcorn. Buy us popcorn. I was like, oh, I have cash. <laughs> and I went and I bought them popcorn. As I'm standing in line, there's a lady with her kids trying to go into a matinee movie. And I just kind of turned around and, and you know, just one of those, just let me see who's behind me. And I could see her kids saying, Mommy, we want this, we want that. And she's counting inside her purse what she has. And I, I, I just knew that look because I, I grew up with a mom. And sometimes the moms are like counting. They're like, if I buy you an $8 Snickers bar, I won't have gas for the rest of the week. And if I buy it for you, I got to buy it for Timmy and Tommy. And So I turned around and says, hey, what do you all want? It's on me. She gave me a look like this. Thank you. Patrick gave me 50 bucks. I did not know that the money in my hand had a purpose to bless a woman and her kids. That's the purpose of what's put in your hand. It was never meant for you to just consume it because if you consume it, you worship it. But if you allow currency to flow, it gets exactly to who God's kingdom was supposed to impact. Are you with me? Let it go. Put money in its place. It's either God is my supply or the money is my supply. So what do you do with this? Put money in its place. I'm done. I'm finished. Put money in its place. When we ask, the reason why God talks about giving more than anything else is simple. He wants you to say, money, you don't, I don't worship you, I worship God, and this money will bow down to God. It's saying, God, I am involved in your banking system. You can trust me. I am a worthy steward. I will leverage this money for your kingdom. It will not leverage me for the kingdom of darkness. Are we together? To be continued in a few months from now. It's very, very important that you understand this. Because if you get this, if you embrace this, your life is never the same. In my family, my wife is the one who worries. Maybe not. Not anymore. But she used to be like, how are we going to do this? And I look at her and just like, just, just watch. It's going to come together. Why? Because I've got this secret. We're seeking after God. I don't work for that. I don't work for that person or my clients. I work for God. If he closes the door, the door's closed, but guess what? He's never without. So I'll never be without. Are you with me? 
Did, did you know that net worth is a kingdom of darkness ideology? It's a, king, it's a kingdom of darkness ideology because it's you measuring you up according to earthly standards. The richest people are unknown on this planet because they're not functioning on a currency of the United States dollar. They're functioning on the kingdom economics where the true wealth is eternal. As we come to a close this morning, there are several ways for you to give. We don't ask you to give because we want something from you. We invite you to give faithfully because God has something for you. He wants to trust you as an asset manager. Amen? I'll invite up Pastor RJ to come close us out. As I pray for you. God, I just ask that this word does something in our hearts. Fulfills every intention that you have to change us radically so that we may participate and be ignited in this, in this new kingdom that you've brought in. We repent for being caught up in the earth system, a broken system, for trusting broken monuments. But today's the day that my wallet, this church's wallet, bows down to you. And the spirit of money no longer controls us, but only the spirit of God drives us and compels us into good things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.